So today we're going to cover three example exam questions that you'll find in an AS or A-level exam in the UK. But these exam questions may be very similar to the ones that you'll face in your country. So AS and A-level exams are typically taken by 16 to 17 year olds. But do make sure you check with your teacher to see what type of dimensional analysis exam questions you're going to face and the exact mark scheme as well. Anyway, let's start with the first question. A stone falls into a well and gains a velocity of V by the time it strikes the water at the bottom, having fallen a distance of S metres. The equation describing this motion is V squared is equal to U squared plus 2GS, where U is the initial velocity of the stone and G is the acceleration due to gravity. Show using dimensional analysis that this formula is dimensionally consistent and justify your answer. So this is a four mark question here and we're going to dive into how to get the first mark. So the first mark comes from recalling what the dimensions are for velocity, the gravitational acceleration and the displacement here and writing these dimensions appropriately for all variables here. So we're going to start off with the S variable, which is the, which is the distance the stone travels as it falls down the well. So we always put our variables in square brackets, like so. And the displacement is simply a length. It has dimensions of length. Now U and V are the initial velocity and the final velocity of the stone. Now velocity has dimensions of length over time. And lastly, we have the acceleration due to gravity. Now the acceleration due to gravity is simply an acceleration. And we normally see it as 9.81 meters per second squared. So from the units here, we can see that our acceleration has dimensions of length over time squared. And we can represent this as time to the minus two. So representing our dimensions in this way, for whatever variables we have in our equation, will give us our first mark. To get our second mark for this question, we need to state that this value of two here is a dimensionless quantity. It doesn't have any dimensions. It cannot be represented by a length or a time. It's simply a constant. So any number we have within our equation as a coefficient is a dimensionless quantity. And that's our second mark. So to get our third mark, we need to substitute these dimensions here into our original equation. Now some variables here are raised to a power and we need to take this into consideration. So our velocity squared, for example, can be placed into square brackets like this, but the dimensions of a velocity squared can be found simply by squaring each dimension of length and time. So we have a length here to the power of one. And when we square that, we get a length to the power of two. And when we square our time dimension here, we're simply multiplying these powers together. So minus one times two is minus two. So we've got a time of minus two. We can do the same with the initial velocity term. So u squared is equal to length squared multiplied by time to the minus two. And our final term, 2gs, is equal to our dimensions of acceleration, lt minus two, multiplied 
by the dimensions of the displacement, which is L. By tidying this up, we've got L squared, length squared, multiplied by time to the minus two. So what you notice here is that each term has the same dimensions. In other words, on the left-hand side of the equation, we've got a length squared multiplied by a time to the negative two, which is equal to a length squared to a time minus two, plus a length squared to a time minus two. Now, when we have two terms here that have the same dimensions, and they're either added together or subtracted, these dimensions can be reduced to L squared t to the minus two. And this will make sense if you just consider the lengths, for example. So if you have two lengths that are added together, this will result in a length. Or if you have two times added together or subtracted, you'll still end up with a time dimension. So to get the final mark, you have to show here that the formula is dimensionally consistent because each term in our equation has the same dimensions. Now the second question is only a two mark question, but it's telling us that the magnitude of the gravitational force F between two masses, M1 and M2, with centers at a distance d apart is given by this equation here, where g is a constant. Now with this question, we must prove that g has dimensions of length cubed mass to the minus one, time to the minus two. And to get the first mark here, we need to be able to recall what the dimensions of force are. We know that from Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So because dimensions must balance on both sides of the equation, we know that force has dimensions of mass, length and time in some proportion. So we write this equation in square brackets again. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we know that dimensions of mass can be represented by capital M. And as we saw from the previous question, acceleration has dimensions of length over time squared. So our dimensions of force must equal mass length over time squared. For M1 and M2 here, they simply have dimensions of mass and our distance is a length. So to get our first mark here, we must display the dimensions of force, mass and distance, and that will give us our first mark. Now to get our second mark, we must prove that G here has dimensions of length cubed, mass to the minus one, time to the minus two. And we can do that by rearranging our original equation here to make G the subject of the formula. So all we need to do now is substitute our dimensions for each variable here into this equation and simplify. So for dimensions of G, our gravitational constant, we've got D squared, which is a length squared. We've got our dimensions of force, which we worked out to be mass times length over time squared. So mass length over times squared. And we've got two masses at the bottom here multiplied together. So that would result in a mass, a dimensions of mass squared. Now we can treat dimensions like regular algebraic quantities. So we can cancel out powers here. So a length squared multiplied by a length to the power of one is a length cubed. So we can write length cubed there. 
Now we don't have any other powers of t, so we can leave that alone. So we've got time to the power of minus 2. Now when you divide two bases, their powers subtract. And as you can see, our dimensions here agree with the dimensions in the question. So our final question says, the position s of a particle moving under uniform acceleration a over time t can be expressed with this equation, where s is equal to some dimensionless constant k multiplied by a to the power of m multiplied by t to the power of n. So our goal here is to find out what these powers are assuming that this equation is dimensionally consistent. So we already know that the dimensions on both sides of the equation already balance. And we need to somehow find out what these powers are of m and n. So to get our first mark, we need to express these variables here as dimensional quantities. So we've already been told that k doesn't have any dimensions. It's a dimensionless constant. So we can ignore this variable here. We can express a to the power of m and t to the power of n in a single square bracket as a m t n. We know, and we know that a is an acceleration, which is a length over time squared. And this is raised to the power of m. And we know t has dimensions of time, so we can express this as t raised to the power of n. And we know s is a position, in other words, a displacement. So s is equal to a length. So we have here a length to the power of 1 is equal to a length to the power of m. And all we're doing here is simply multiplying this power by each dimension within the brackets here. We've got t to the power of minus 2m because minus 2 multiplied by a power of m is equal to minus 2m. And this is multiplied by t to the power of n. Now we can also write t to the power of 0 here. And t to the power of 0 simply equals 1. But we're placing a dimension of time on this side simply to help us with our simultaneous equations in a minute. When we have two bases multiplied together, we can add the powers here. So we can simplify this side of the equation, giving us a length to the power of m multiplied by a time to the power of n minus 2m. And what we've done here is simply added these two powers together. So our equation becomes length to the power of 1, t to the power of 0 is equal to length to the power of m, t to the power of n minus 2m. Now we can create two simultaneous equations here simply by looking at the powers on each side. So we've got a dimension of length on this side of the equation and a single dimension of length on this side of the equation. So we can take out the powers here and write this as 1 is equal to m. And we can do this because the dimensions must be equal on both sides of the equation. So in other words, our length on this side of the equation to the power of 1 must be equal to a length to the power of 1 on this side of the equation. So in other words, m is equal to 1. Now the reason why I put time to the power of 0 here is because time must balance on both sides of the equation. 
time to the power of zero is equal to one, so that doesn't affect this length here. So if we have a look at the powers on both sides of the equation here. We've got an n minus 2m is equal to zero because we've got no dimensions of time on this side of the equation. According to our equation up here, we've only got a length here. But we do have a dimension of time on the right hand side of the equation. So the powers must balance. So we already know what the power of m is. So we already know what the value of m is here. So we can substitute this value into this equation. So we got 0 is equal to n minus 2 times 1. And we can rearrange this now to find the value of n. n is simply equal to 2.